major sections of the entire Bible. So I want to encourage you this morning to keep reading the assigned readings and as well keep working your way through the study guide questions. For in so doing, you will probably have completed, let me say this, the first year, the equivalent of a first year college course entitled Introduction to the Bible. Of course, minus the term paper and the final exam. But if you would like the final exam and the term paper, we can make those available for you as well. But you know, more importantly, friends, if you just keep reading the assigned readings and you keep working through the study guide, you're going to be able to understand much more fully God's great plan of how he's drawing people to himself. And that's really what the purpose of this series is all about. And furthermore, we think we'll be able to equip you, if you keep at the reading and keep doing the study guide, be able to explain to others what God's great plan of salvation is all about. So I just encourage you this morning to stay, to stay at it. Now, in week 18 of our series, we find ourselves in the 6th century. We're in modern-day Iraq. We're, we're in the city of Babylon, or the nation of Babylon. And furthermore, in today's passage, we're going to encounter three really outstanding young men. Yes, three good-looking, gifted, talented, and well-trained young men. You might say the graduates of the University of Babylon who are going to show us what it means to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And furthermore, and this will be our focus here this morning, they're going to show us that there can be a real upside to being in exile. An upside to difficult and challenging circumstances. So at this time, would you open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3. If you have no Bible, you can go to your bulletin this morning and you'll find the text printed on a handout in your bulletin. And as you do that, I'm going to just quickly introduce to you Scott Turner, who's going to join me today in the ministry of God's Word. Let me just say a few things about Scott here. Scott's a third year student at TRU, majoring in literature, but not Babylonian literature, I understand. English literature, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, secondly, Scott was recently married to uh, Stacy Rowett, who is sitting right here this morning. She's going to attend both services to support Scott here this morning. <laughs> and uh, thirdly, Scott and Stacy are presently part of our young adult ministries here on Monday evenings, uh, as well as part of the uh, Christian Club on the campus of Trinity, uh, excuse me, not Trinity, Thompson Rivers <laughs> University. And fourthly, and this is why Scott is standing here this morning. When Scott was serving at Garden Lake Bible Camp in the summer, he really sensed God's call upon his life to go into ministry. So they're presently planning to attend seminary after they've graduated from TRU. So I ask you to pray for Scott, pray for Stacy as they make plans to follow God's call upon their life. But for that matter, keep praying for all our young people as they seek to follow God's call upon their life, whatever that occupation is going to be. Well, let's now open ourselves up to God's Word here this morning to see what He wants to teach us through this great Old Testament story. I invite you to try to visualize this story as Scott and I read it here this morning. So, Scott, lead away. King Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has 
issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And now the key verses of this passage of scripture, where they respond to this worship or else mandate from King Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them changed. You, think, you see, up to this point, I think he really liked these guys. They were really great administrators in his kingdom. So then he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. In other words, as hot as it possibly could be. And commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his fate in a complete amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire upon them. A miracle for sure, in proportion, I would say, to the dividing of the Red Sea. Well, then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree, that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut to pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Scott's going to now give us some background information to this passage and answer the question, what in the world does this passage aim to teach us here in the city of Camelot today? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who are these guys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are friends of Daniel, and they're all natives of Jerusalem. In chapter 1 of the book of Daniel, we find that Daniel and his friends are slaves in the land of Babylon. They're in exile. Then God gives these four men with knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. So much so that King Nebuchadnezzar valued them as ten times better than his own men. Furthermore, Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel's gift in the second chapter places him in the court of the king Nebuchadnezzar, and he's given the privilege of petitioning the king to allow his three friends to, well, basically get good jobs as administrators of Babylon. This brings us to chapter 3, in which we find Daniel's three friends as administrators of Babylon, and as well as being in exile, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. 
exile and how we should respond to it. Often when the word exile is spoken, it's deemed a very negative term. And many words come to mind to describe it, like outcast, cut off, alone, or desperate. In order to really understand what exile is, here's a definition of the word. Exile is a situation in which you are forced to leave your country or home and go to live in a foreign country. This is obviously very uncomfortable, as you're not usually choosing to be removed from everything you know. For example, the conflict going on in Syria for the last couple of years is a good example of this. As of one year ago, in February 14, there are speculated to be over 144,000 refugees in exile from Syria in just one camp. And there were many more camps than just this one. That was also a statistic from about a year ago, and the numbers have probably grown to be quite a bit higher. Those people have to be wondering, why is this happening, and what good could possibly come from? For most of us, we don't view exile as very good at all. These thoughts, however, are very human and we naturally only see from a lower story perspective. As human beings, we don't like our circumstances being changed by anybody but ourselves. We don't like change. So we have to try and understand how exile fits into God's plan. Let's take a look step by step at what the text tells us about God's plan for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in exile, and what we may learn for ourselves from it. Verses 1 to 3 explain the setting for the events in the story. We're told that King Nebuchadnezzar has made a cold statue and orders everybody in his lands to worship it on command. So that gives us the context. Then verses 4 to 7 give us the stakes, which happens to be life or death by being thrown into a furnace. I think it's important to note that the method of the threat of death is a furnace. This is because a death in a furnace is a consuming one, and you don't just perish, but you're consumed by the flames until nothing's left. So now that we have the setting, which is in the land of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, and the states, which is life or death, remember, we need a hero, or three of them. Verses 8 to 12 inform us that some of the Babylonians have noticed that some of the Jewish people have decided to disobey the king. Not just anybody was disobeying, but it was the Babylonian slaves, remember. The Jewish people are from the nation they conquered. Additionally, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in positions of power. And so they should be displaying a good example of how to follow their king. Then the story continues through verses 13 to 18. And the three friends are brought before the king so that he may verify what he hears is true. I think up to this point, he actually really liked these guys. He explains that they're to worship his idol or burn as a result. The three friends don't even bother finishing his trial. They just simply tell him that they will not worship anyone but the one true God and that he will deliver them from the fiery furnace. And what is even more admirable is that then they say, even if he doesn't deliver us, we still won't worship God. You can imagine how angry this made the king. In fact, the king was so enraged that he heated his furnace seven times hotter than they normally heat up the furnace. I believe that action was put in the story simply to show how angry the king was with them, as I'm sure that the regular furnace heat was probably enough to execute. The furnace even kills the soldiers who throw in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because it was just that hot. Through all of this, the friends still held their resolve. And then a wonderful and fantastic miracle is performed in verses 24 and 25. King Nebuchadnezzar jumps up in haste and is simply in disbelief. Did we not cast three men into the fire, he asked? Yes, the king did. And now the three friends are walking around in the furnace with a fourth figure. Because of their faith and trust in God, he not only delivered them, but was with them in some form within the fire. Then in verses 26 to 30, the king declares the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be a God honored in all the land because nobody can save like he can. The three friends' trials and their threat of death allowed God to use them in a way that opened up a whole nation to meet him. Not only that, but that nation that's being opened up to God is the conquering nation, the Babylonians. And they're slaves of the people who are revealing God to them. In the lower story, it's usually the conquerors who force their gods onto conquered nations. But in the story, God uses Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to do the exact opposite of what we expect to see. You see, no matter how difficult the challenge is, or how much we're being oppressed, 
Our God is clearly a God who saves. Knowing this, and having full trust in this, allowed God to work in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not simply because God knows he can, but because the three friends fully trusted that God could work in their lives. So I'm just going to summarize the story quickly in order to focus on the key verses in the passage. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are all in exile and refuse to worship a statue that Nebuchadnezzar set up as an idol. They're found faulty in their worship and are brought before the king. They are facing a life or death situation in their exile in Babylon. If they refuse to worship the statue, they're going to be killed and they're going to be burned alive. But incredibly, this is how they respond. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Notice as well how they continually say your majesty and respect the king despite their denial of his worship. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or the gold statue that you have set up. And what happens? An amazing miracle happens, and they're saved. These three don't burn because of their unyielding faith, and God walks with them in the fire. The king Nebuchadnezzar then proclaims throughout the entire nation, their God is the highest God, for no other can save like he can. What a way to witness to someone. Now, I believe this story is also applicable to our lives today, despite the fact that none of us are in exile. Another way to think about exile is to say that it's a less than desirable life circumstance. I'm sure there's many of us who are going through tough life circumstances that seem unassailable from every angle. Maybe you have a parent who's in an old folks home and who needs increasingly more care from you and you just don't have the time. Or maybe you're not getting along with co-workers as much as you'd like to. And it's not just making work difficult, but slowly burying hatred or apathy deep in your heart. Or maybe you're a student, and it seems that all your professors are against you, piling on more than you have time for. <laughs> or maybe you get stuck in an airport for several days because a massive snowstorm has hit Camloops, and you can't get home. That was me. There are lots of life circumstances that we face every day, but as people loved by God, we have a God who we can turn to when we feel overwhelmed. We have a God who responds to vulnerability in his people rather than their strength. We have a God who genuinely loves and cares for us, if only we would open our hearts to him. The story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego tell us how we should respond in less than desirable life circumstances. Here were guys not only in exile, but also facing a life or death circumstance. Because they responded faithfully, these three, three friends experienced what was probably the most important moment of their lives. This allowed them to be a great witness to a pagan king who let it be known to the peoples over his entire nation that no god saves like ours can. Could you imagine having that happen in a place like Kamloops because you took a high risk stand for your faith? Now let me take you back to the airport for a Nobody likes being stuck on the airport on your way home from a vacation, and we were no exception. It's stressful, there's an awful lot of standing in lines that just don't seem to move, and most importantly, you don't know when you're going to get home. When we first got on a plane to get to Vancouver from Vegas, our flight was delayed two hours. This delay caused us to miss our next flight, but we weren't ready to give up on getting home just yet. We decided to wait on standby for a flight Sunday night at 10.55 p.m., which we got on. However, when we reached Kamloops, the plane was unable to land, and so we had to turn around and return to Vancouver, and we were certainly disheartened when we finally reached the Sheraton Hotel at 2 a.m. in the morning. The hotel, by the way, was the first good thing to come to us, as it was provided for that night as compensation for not being able to get home. We were told Monday morning that they could put us on standby the entire day in the airport for each flight, except that most of the flights were still returning that day. So it didn't look that great. <laughs> so we had to make a decision. Should we stare in the airport all day, trying to beat our circumstances like we attempted the night before? Or do we try and give it up to God and just take the next flight in a few days that we can for sure get on and land? We decided to take the second option because we knew that it wouldn't be healthy for us to sit in the airport for multiple days. So we gave up our struggling and worked on our patience 
which is always good for me to do, and enjoyed an additional night in the same hotel in Vancouver. The second day, Stacy and I even made a trip into the city to make visits to Stanley Park and the Vancouver Aquarium. I discovered she'd never been there before, and so that ended up being a really cool opportunity that was given to us that we wouldn't have had if we tried to stay in the airport and just get the earliest flight back. We finally got home on Tuesday night at about 11.30, ending our journey at last. So that after all of that, to be honest, when we were at the airport, it felt a little bit like exile. Due to circumstances beyond our control, we were unable to get home to where we lived. On top of that, we had to realize that complaining about our circumstances would solve literally nothing. And that we had to accept that God was keeping us in Vancouver for the time being. And as such, we might as well make the best of it. <laughs> so to bring you back to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the next time you hit a less than desirable life circumstance, think about this story. Try to respond in a, to your circumstance in a trusting, God-focused way. And if you do, I think you'd be surprised to see what he has in store for you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You know, just for a few moments, I would like to build upon what Scott has shared with us here this morning. Scott shared with us this morning that exile, yes, as Scott puts it, a less than desirable circumstance can be a great opportunity for God to go work in us and possibly even through us. You know, I really believe that to be true. Yes, there can be a real upside, you might say, to our most difficult circumstances that we face in life. Admittedly, it's not always easy to see the upside, you might say, of a dark moment, of a difficult circumstance in life. But I believe many of you would say to me here this morning, after you've gone through a really difficult time, and now I quote many of you, you would say this, the hardships I have had to, have to face have caused me to trust and love God more. Furthermore, the hardships and difficulties I have faced have helped me to become a more mature individual, more mature person, and a more faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And you know, I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would also say the same thing. Although I'm sure they did not appreciate living in exile away from their beloved Israel, and although they most certainly did not appreciate the fact that they had to face a life and death situation simply because of their love for God, nevertheless, their difficult circumstances led, I think, them to the greatest day of their lives. They experienced a miraculous deliverance. And secondly, because of their loyalty to God in the face of death, they were a profound, profound influence upon King Nebuchadnezzar and all who witnessed that event that day. They were able to communicate to Nebuchadnezzar that there was a God mightier than even the value of their own lives. And yes, all this took place, friends, in exile, in less than desirable circumstances. Friends, I highly believe there's room for mourning and anger in the lives of those who follow Jesus Christ. I believe it would have been most appropriate for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to mourn the loss and destruction of their country and to mourn the destruction of their glorious temple in Jerusalem. I also believe it would have been appropriate for them to be angry with their nation as leaders who led them into sin and ultimately into exile. But ultimately, God called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and all the other exiles to accept exile, to accept the fact that they were under God's disciplining hand. And now they were to accept the fact that they were to be a blessing to the people of Babylon. Yes, as we read in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, and that's really a key chapter in the book of Jeremiah, where he says this to the exiles. Here's what God has for you in exile. I want you to seek the peace and prosperity of the cities to which you find yourself in. You're there for a reason. Likewise, we are to accept hardships, less than desirable circumstances that come our way. In fact, we're to accept these hardships as an expression of God's loving hand towards us, his loving discipline toward us. As we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, 
Here's the perspective we are to have when difficulties come our way, when hardships come our way. And, and Paul, who the writer of Hebrews says this, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. They, that is our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. That is how followers of Christ are to view exile, how they are to view less than desirable circumstances. When facing hardships, whether self-inflicted or from an outside source, we are invited, we are directed to view these hardships as an expression of God's loving hand. So that, and this is so important, so that we may share in God's holiness. In other words, God's character. What God values more than anything else in our lives, friends, is that we reflect his character. Friends, this is a very unique way to view hardship. But when we do, we can find meaning, yes, great meaning, in the most difficult things that come our way. I have been dialoguing with a person friend over this last week or so, who's going through a really difficult time, a, a tremendously difficult time. But wow, you should see how this person is responding. They're saying to me that God is giving them, giving this person a heart full of wisdom as they respond to the hardships that have come their way. Friends, could it be that our most difficult times are truly God's opportunities to get through to us? Could it be that our most difficult circumstances in life could become our greatest day? Just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? Could our most difficult times be great opportunities for us to be a witness to those who really need to know of God's great plan? Friends, I believe so. So when facing exile or less than desirable circumstances, I think we do well to pray prayers like this. Heavenly Father, what are you wanting to teach me? I think we should have that prayer as a way of life. Father, what are you wanting to teach me today, even in the midst of my darkest hour? Heavenly Father, are there any things in my life that you'd want to change? This person I've been in contact with says, oh, there's so many changes going on in my life. And they're all for the better. Or Heavenly Father, is, there an, is this an opportunity to be a witness to your amazing grace? Friends, I, I believe asking God such questions will help us really stay God-focused. And as well, will allow God to work both in us and through us. Even in the midst, friends, our most difficult days. And ask about prayer with me. Father, give us eyes to see.